I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. Thanks so much for coming on. All you people in other states and other time zones. I'm really impressed. I'm impressed with Stuart that he knows everyone. Um, I'm Mindy Towsley. I'm the executive director of the Artists Archives of the Western Reserve. I'd like to start out by thanking everyone who supports the archives. The Bernice and David E. Davis Art Foundation, the Cliven Foundation, the Gunn Foundation, the Zupal Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, and the taxpayers of Cuyahoga County here in Ohio, represented by Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. I'd also like to thank all of our members and all of our archived artists and all of those of you who are not members or archived artists, but still support us with your donations. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Um, I'd like to introduce my staff tonight. Uh, Kelly Pontoni is helping us with tech. She is also recording this for you. And Megan Elves, who is our manager of programming and marketing. Um, Megan, in just a minute, is going to uh, go over some housekeeping. There are some new things in Zoom, which you can do, uh, which she'll talk to you about. One of them is live transcriptions. And um, I'd just like to mention the mission of the archives. We were formed to support the legacies of the Ohio artists, and we do this by collecting their work. We collect representative bodies of their work. Uh, we, to date, we have 95 artists and 10,000 works in the archives. We suspect that we are the largest museum in Ohio with the most amount of Ohio artists. Not the largest museum in size, but the largest in terms of the number of works by Ohio artists that we have. Um, so if anybody knows anything different, please get in touch with me. Um, we are having a little hard time just verifying this, but we suspect that this is the case. We do have a physical location in University Circle, which is a very vibrant and growing part of Cleveland, Ohio. We're located next to the Lakeview Cemetery in the same building as the Sculpture Center. The building was built for us by the David Davis Foundation. We have a regular gallery space and Stuart Pearl is our solo exhibition until March 12th. Stories in Light is the name of his exhibition, as you can see on the PowerPoint there on your screen. And our, our hours are Wednesday through Friday from 10 to four and Saturday from 12 to four. So if you do live around here and you haven't come in to see the exhibition yet, please do come in and see it. Um, I know that Stuart is going to show you some works from the exhibition and some works that are not in the exhibition. So you're gonna to have to come in and see the whole thing in person to really see it. We have produced a catalog for the exhibition and those are for sale through the archives and also through Amazon. If you buy them for, through Amazon, it's the same price, $12. You will pay shipping on that. And um, I would recommend that you buy it through Amazon Smile because if you do that, we get a slightly extra donation. I just wanna give a little shout out to our archives members, those who are artists. The members exhibition is coming up. The date that it opens is March 24th. The postcards have a little typo on them. The drop off for the members exhibition is March 8th through March 12th. The exhibition opens in March. The drop-off is not in April, mea culpa. Um, so I think that's it. So I'm gonna move this program on to Megan Ells. Megan, let's take it away. Ooh. Welcome to this program today. So obviously this is the support program for Stuart Pearl's exhibition, which is a 50 year retrospective. And one of the remarkable things is that Stuart, I, I've told you this, but not to make you blush, we've had amazing feedback from people coming into the show. And one of the most striking things is that I don't think people often get the opportunity to see their home and the place that they live photographed and treated with such artistic reverence. Stuart does an excellent job at finding the beauty in everyday moments and moments that make Northeast Ohio, Northeast Ohio. Things like the flats and our industrial landscape and all of our nitty gritty rust beltness that really make us shine. And while everyone doesn't always see their home that way, I think that us in Cleveland particularly have a little bit of a trouble seeing it considering we've had to endure five decades of people giving us 
fun things after the Cuyahoga caught fire. So the fact is that Stuart, this exhibition not only shows your amazing technical prowess, but really makes the people of this region feel beautiful and welcome. So thank you for that. A little on Stuart's background, and then we'll get into some Zoom housekeeping, those new features. So Stuart's work tonight is going to sort of chronicle his career. So I don't have to get into it too much, but just a couple of accolades from Stu so you know his background. So Stu is a lifelong resident of Cleveland, as you can probably tell from those images actually appreciating the region. And he's also a second generation Ohio artist. His father is Moses Pearl, who's also archived in our permanent collection and who you'll actually see a little appearance by later in through Stu's photographs. Uh, Stuart believes that subjects like the Interbelt Bridge, the Urban Skylines, and the Emerald Necklace, which is the Metro Parks, are, all present opportunities for storytelling through the art of photography. Stuart studied at Miami University, sorry, University, where he graduated with a BA in anthropology and studies in photography. And he attended Kent State University for graduate study in photojournalism. Among many notable achievements, uh, Stuart was the art director for AT&T, yes, the AT&T in Cleveland. And fun fact, Stuart is also the acting board president of the Artist Archives of the Western Reserve. But tonight it's Artist Stu we're gonna be talking about. Uh, Stu is exhibited extensively, including the Erie Art Museum, the Butler Museum of American Art, and his work is included in numerous private collections. So on to a little tech. I know you guys are all really familiar with Zoom at this point. Uh, but just how we're running this program. So there is a chat um, and you can see that in the side of your screen for most configurations. Uh, we will be able to see that, but obviously, um, you know, it's we're not gonna be right on it. But if you do have a problem, go ahead and put it in the chat and raise your hand. I'll be able to see it that way. Um, and that's using the Zoom function. If you physically raise your hand, I will not see you, your camera is off. So. Q&A, next good part of it, there's going to be an extensive period where we can talk with Stu and you have two options there. You can either at the time raise your hand in the Zoom and I can allow you to talk. We'll be able to hear your audio, but we won't be able to see you. So you can kind of converse with Stu that way. If you want to be a little bit more in the background, you can also type your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Looks like two little chat bubbles. Go ahead and put your questions in there and then I will read them out loud for you. Finally, there is a new feature, which we're really excited about for accessibility. Um, now we offer live transcripts and closed captioning of the programming. How you access this as an audience member is there's a little CC, it says live trans, uh, transcription right next to it. Go ahead and hit it and you can enable the live transcription. You have the option of actually read it, having the live transcription roll down in the side of your screen. So that's gonna be viewed full transcription, and you can even save it for later review. Outside of that, the program will be recorded. We'll have it on the website, uh, usually within a week of the broadcast date. And uh, that should be all the nitty gritty. Again, raise your hand if you need help. And we look forward to seeing you on the other side of the presentation for some Q&A. And without further ado, Stuart, go ahead, take it away. OK, uh, everybody, please bear with me. I guess at this point, I share my screen. OK, all right. All right, how, how, are, how is everything looking there? Looking good, but make sure to put it in the full screen mode, so. Okay. And, and how you do that is display settings, drop it down, and then swap presenter view and slideshow. Okay, all right, how does that look? Go ahead and actually hit it. I think you just highlighted it. Uh, oops. One more time. We'll get it. All right. All right. I'm still seeing a little bit. Yeah. One more. Try that. Always the magic of Zoom. No worries, people, we'll grab it. I'd say go ahead and end the slideshow to start it again, and then let's see what the settings do. Okay. All right. 
there's always a gremlin in Zoom. I learned there's always one. All right, we're looking good. I, I think you got it. Okay. Yes, perfect. What happens when you have two monitors? Sorry about that. <laughs> That's true. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for your, your patience on that little glitch there. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And I want to thank you all for uh, taking this part of your Wednesday evening to uh, spend it with me. That uh, you know, really means a lot, uh, especially to see the list of people uh, coming on. Thank you so much. And of course, to uh, Mindy, Kelly, uh, Megan, I know you put a lot of time into you know, assembling the exhibition and, and designing the show and making it possible for, uh, for this to happen. So uh, this, this presentation, um, it's, it was actually created uh, from, from two things, um, sort of an origin story. It came out of COVID and also uh, my wife making a little suggestion to me last year. She approached me one evening and she says, uh, you know, Stu, we've got a lot of free time here since we're cooped up on the in, uh, in the house. And uh, why don't you spend a little time down into the basement and uh, you know, tidy up your photography collection a little bit. Well, I'm kind of a pack rat and I've saved pretty much all the prints, negatives, slides, uh, matted pieces and frame pieces from the last 50 years. It's generally fairly well organized, but it needed a little bit of tidying. tidying. So I began going through it and um, started um, uh, you know, reminiscing down memory lane, you know, things that happened decades ago and whatnot. And the concept for a 50 year retrospective kind of uh, grew out of that. So people usually approach me on my photography and they ask, what do I photograph and, and why? Well, I'm attracted to interesting light, attractive light, uh, shadows, shapes, textures, form, composition, that sort of thing. I try to carry my camera with me um, in a lot of places that I go. And when I was still working at at and I uh, had a special little uh, messenger bag with a compartment in it that I carried my camera. And going downtown early in the morning and then uh, leaving late in the uh, evening, uh, late in the afternoon, I got to see some really attractive light. So, uh, you know, I love the, the architecture we have on the lakefront, uh, the, the skyline and whatnot. It was all very fascinating and all a legitimate target for, for my camera there. Okay. So as far as the early years go, I probably first got really fascinated by, uh, with photography when I was about seven or eight years old. Uh, and that's when I got my, my first camera, which was a little brownie. My father, who Megan mentioned, was a, uh, uh, he's also an archived artist, and he was a very productive artist for over seven decades. He also ta taught art. I would see him around our house taking pictures of his work. He had an old Argus C3. He would photograph the works of his students and whatnot. And he would take this little thing out of the camera when he was done called a roll of film. He'd go off to the drugstore. And then a couple days later, he would return home with a little box of prints and show me. And, and to me, to a little kid, you know, eight years old, that was just pure magic because I remembered what happened a few days ago when he took that picture and here it was all over again. So I was just really excited about that. Uh, fortunately, any of my work from those early years no longer exists. <laughs> There'd be nothing to write home about. But Let's you know, fast forward about 15 years or so and take the money that I uh, got from paper routes and other odd jobs and whatnot. And I finally purchased uh, my first real single lens reflex camera. So here we have what are called the early words, uh, the early years and the world around me. Well, when you're first starting out, you know, either as a kid or a serious photographer, what do you photograph? Well, you take pictures of the people who mean something in your life, uh, pets, your environs, your household. Uh, this is a picture of my mother, and she would have been in her early 50s at the time. And that's her pet cat, Culligan, who my brother found uh, on the West Coast. Uh, it was a litter of kittens that was born on a Culligan water heater, I guess, hence the name. 
and he brought her home. And I had totally forgotten that I had taken this picture until I rediscovered the negatives uh, just about a month ago. I really like the light on this, uh, the expression and the emotion on my mother's face, and then whatever the hell that cat is fascinated with. So uh, it was fun to shoot. My father, as I mentioned, was a very prolific artist. Uh, we had a small uh, studio uh, in the den on the back of our house. It was great and worked well for you know, small pieces. Whenever he worked large, he had to go out into the garage, which was perfectly okay during the good weather. Um, Cleveland's winters don't permit that, so then he migrated to the basement. This picture I shot in the mid 70s and he was in the middle of a project creating a large mural for the uh, walls of the gymnasium at South High School where he taught. The finished mural measured four feet high by 40 feet long and obviously that wasn't was not going to fit in the uh, basement door in our den so he did it piece by piece here in the um, uh, in, in the garage. About this time, uh, I, was, I had begun my um, sophomore year at Miami University down in Oxford, Ohio, and I took that single lens reflex camera, and I was very excited to discover that they had a campus newspaper and they were looking for photographers. So I immediately started shooting for the paper, and this was a very important uh, formative part of my life because when you shoot for a newspaper, the first thing that you learn is they work on deadline. There's a start and there's a finish and there's all the stuff that goes in between and you have to pay attention to the detail. Um, when I took my assignments, I learned right away that upon arriving at the location, you need to very quickly uh, analyze what's going on. Where is the center of action? Um, what's potentially the important iconic photograph that uh, you might be able to take back that people can identify with, you know, in the future as, you know, this is what this event was all about. So I really learned a lot of the key principles of, call it documentary or photojournalistic photography at this point in time, 50 years ago. And that became carried forward into a lot of the style that I, um, uh, you know, continue to do. Now, while at my, on Miami, uh, I became a, um, an anthropology major. And um, one of the, uh, actually my first major documentary project was to participate in an archeological dig in the summer of 1971 uh, down in Southwest Ohio. We spent 10 weeks on a, a farm in the hot, dusty, did I say it was hot, uh, alfalfa field there. And uh, because it would get so hot early in the day, we had to get up at an odd, ungodly, the time and we would typically arrive there around 7 a.m. 7 a. Matter of fact, there's a, a, a lady, a former uh, a, a friend and former coworker uh, on this call who was on that dig by the name of Lorna. She, may, she probably re, uh, remembers a few of these pictures. That tent you see is actually a, a scrounged army surplus parachute that we got at a surplus store. And uh, yeah, there's me in the lower left-hand corner there uh, doing some photography. And uh, that line of uh, shovelers down in the lower right, that was a pretty typical day, clearing brush and uh, preparing the ground for our excavation plots. So again, this was my first formal documentary project. And uh, the uh, grad students running that made sure I did my job. And I learned some really good uh, lessons there. Also, while shooting uh, for the paper, I got to uh, cover some really interesting newsworthy events. In 1972, we had a presidential campaign, and the uh, Democratic frontrunner was uh, Governor uh, was uh, George McGovern. You can see him there in the center. That's uh, Ted Kennedy on the right. Uh, there's uh, Congressman Stokes, and then uh, uh, John Gilligan on the left, who was Ohio's governor. This was down at the old Cleveland Arena on Euclid Avenue. It's no longer there, but it was pretty cool to be there uh, you know, with all the cheering and, and all the delegates uh, to see what was going on. Now, another really cool thing about being a campus newspaper photographer 
is you get to go to all the concerts and shoot the rock stars. So I got to uh, see some pretty interesting people. There's uh, Elton John on the left side there. Uh, in 1973, he would have been, I think, about 24 or 25. There's Dionne Warwick uh, on the right. Don't know how old she was, but boy, could she sing and, and continue to do so for a long time. Here we have middle center stage. There's Cheech and Chong. Remember, uh, Dave's not here. Okay. Uh, off on the right, there is Doc Severinsen, who is the uh, band leader of the Tonight Show band for Johnny Carson. And uh, on the left, there's uh, Ian Anderson of uh, Jethro Tull and uh, uh, one of his uh, backup people there. So it was exciting times and uh, had a lot of fun covering a, a variety of events. As I continued with my photography, I began exploring the environs around um, uh, Oxford, Ohio and, and, and Cleveland and whatnot. And it was kind of a normal evolution into what's called street photography, which is just kind of a catch-all phrase for a guy with a camera wandering up and down the street, photographing people, interesting goings on, uh, you know, society at work, construction, whatever. And uh, I, I indulged in this to learn my skill. Uh, like any other family, we would often go on a summer vacation because my father was a teacher. We would get, he would get summertime off. And in, uh, I think it was summer of 71, we went to uh, Cape May, New, New Jersey with our little camping trailer. And uh, one day we did a little day trip up the coast to Atlantic City and did the walk the boardwalk. And I got this uh, really cute picture of this uh, cute little uh, girl uh, just moments before she was consumed by pigeons. Uh, I had some uh, friends down in uh, Florida, and we did a couple road trips down to Key West. And one day when I was walking down a, down the dock, I happened to look up at the side of this uh, Paraguayan uh, freighter, and I saw this little kid kind of looking off, checking me out just as I was checking him out uh, with my lens and uh, grabbed his picture. Uh, what I kind of liked was the, the framing of the uh, uh, superstructure of the boat around, around his uh, face there. Uh, fast forward a few decades, and uh, this is one of my favorite spots. Uh, some of you have probably visited. It's the uh, restored Coast Guard Station, which is on the little jetty by the Cuyahoga River, <clears throat> excuse me, near um, uh, um, uh, Wendy Park. Um, I like to do early morning, late afternoon shots. That low angle sun gives you some really interesting shadows. Here was, here was a guy with his family and they were walking a couple dogs. And what really intrigued me was, was the shadows. And because I'm always looking for interesting, you know, abstracts and illusionary tour, uh, types of images, uh, that's why I call this invisible dog walk. Uh, here's another interesting shot. Um, I did mention that I, I worked for AT&T. Uh, that was about four decades. And in my uh, latter years, uh, I had an office on the 14th floor. Matter of fact, there's another person on this, on this Zoom by the name of Mark. Uh, he knows who he is and he was one of my coworkers. Looking down, we got to see a, a view of the uh, Galleria courtyard. And I was always fascinated by the brickwork of the sidewalk, the uh, tables of the cafe there, people walking by. Once fall arrived and all the leaves left, uh, I noticed that I was getting, I was seeing interesting shadows, again, that low angle sun. And I planned this shot in advance. I had my camera with me for quite a time. And after waiting and experimenting for about three weeks, I got this uh, picture of, uh, uh, you know, people walking down the sidewalk on East 9th Street. I couldn't really see the people, but I did notice their shadows, and that's what really impressed me about it. This originally was a color photograph, but color was unimportant. It would have only detracted. To me, it was all about the shapes and the geometry and the tones of uh, and shades of gray and black and white. My sister Charlene is a uh, uh, an art professor at Tri C West, and uh, a couple of years ago, she was part of a an art show at. Uh, Kent State University. Typically, whenever we do um, uh, a show, you know, the old dinner and a show thing, we go to a restaurant afterwards, and then we, uh, you know, walk it off, taking a little stroll around the neighborhood. This little side street uh, uh, presented me with interesting 
rectangles and squares of glass block and movers and doorways and uh, shadows of, of this lamppost. And then out of the blue, this gentleman goes walking down the street. And what attracted me was, uh, again, the uh, contrast of the, um, call it the, the organic versus the man-made, uh, you know, with all the different shapes there. Again, color was unimportant. So I uh, created this as a uh, black and white conversion. I suppose you could include uh, parades in street photography. Last summer, we had the Pride Parade here in Cleveland, which began at Edgewater Park and progressed on through Lakewood. Typically, when I'm doing action shots like this, I'm, I'm not really pay, paying close attention to details. I'm just kind of observing the overall aspect of what's going on when I'm shooting through a long lens. And it wasn't until I was at home examining the individual images that I discovered a, a real bonus of capture here. And I think uh, maybe you know what I'm talking about, but if you notice the hands there, what does that remind you of? Think Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel. Well, I realize it's a little bit of a stretch, but uh, to me, that was very reminiscent of that. And uh, I got a kick out of the picture. And uh, for this one, how could color not be central to the impact of it? Uh, let's see, on another uh, trip, uh, we took a little, uh, I think it was a spring trip to Washington, DC. Another one of my former coworkers is on this Zoom. Trudy, you know who you are. Uh, and she probably knows where this is. This is the fish market. And uh, this gentleman was very happy to mug for me. Don't know what he meant by a large male and medium female, but you can make up your own captions to that. I do like seafood though. And sometimes street photography can take on a, um, a, a very interesting, uh, almost newsworthy aspect. We had a bit of a scare here at the Artist Archives in September of 2015. The warehouse, which uh, used to be adjacent to our, our, our lot, the old Woodland Supply Company, some refer to it as the uh, rubber duck factory, that caught fire under suspicious, suspicious circumstances. Uh, lucky for us, the uh, Cleveland Fire Department uh, rapidly responded. A bunch of us rushed down there. We expected to be uh, having to run in and pull out paintings and save them on the street, but uh, things went well. To me, this was almost uh, sort of a news shot. Again, color was not important. And I was able to capture these, uh, these, these fine workers, uh, you know, basically saving our building. Uh, another fall trip that uh, my wife Jean and I took was to a place called the Bruce Peninsula, which is up in Canada. It's about four hours north of Toronto. And this little shop down on the left uh, was a favorite place to stop for refreshment and a little bite to eat after an afternoon hike. That's Ida Wiley, who was a, a, a really wonderful proprietor and the shapes of her shop, the colorful aspect of the uh, tuna and chicken salad sandwich on the wall there really kind of caught my eye. And by contrast, um, the picture on the right uh, really captivated my eye with, with the, all the stainless steel framing the, uh, the chef's hard work there. That's Provenance um, restaurant and it's the, the, the kitchen of it in the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, right by the atrium there. And um, about 10 years ago, a very good friend of me, mine and renowned photographer, Jenny Jones, who was on a Zoom too, uh, she hired me to be second shooter for this project. And we were running around the, the atrium taking pictures. I got into the kitchen and I just thought this was a really cool shot. Again, it was pretty much devoid of color. And to me, it was all about uh, the shiny stainless steel and uh, all the shapes hanging from the ceiling. Sometimes a little bite to eat uh, can be as simple as going out to a cafe. And uh, I call this a, a cafe with giggles. This is my good friend, Joe Polavoy. Uh, he knows who he is. Uh, I've known Joe since 1974, great guy. And we got a couple sandwiches from the uh, cafeteria there, went out into the atrium. I finished before he did and um, uh, he proceeded to uh, mug for me uh, uh, during, uh, you know, the, our, our little repast there. So again, thanks a lot, Joe.
I've always been fascinated with construction photography. Uh, that's a, in my heart, that's a special form of documentary uh, coverage. And what I like about it is, uh, at least in my mind, I'm creating a bit of history by capturing a certain moment that will be totally changed, uh, maybe a few minutes later, maybe an hour later, but it's always something that's in, in flux and you, you have a really narrative sense of visual change as this is going on. Now, for all you Clevelanders, do any of you know where this is? Well, uh, this scene no longer exists. Uh, I took this picture back in the mid 70s uh, on my way to work uh, in, in November, one dark and stormy morning. Uh, this is in the area of the old Gordon Park, which is around East 72nd Street and the Shoreway. Currently, this is known as the Dyke 14 Nature Preserve, uh, 88 acres. And this was created by the, the results of the hard, hard work of the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps, Corps of Engineers is tasked with regularly dredging the Cuyahoga River to maintain it as a free and flowing um, river channel for all the freighters that go up and down uh, to the steel mills and that. And they had all this uh, you know, sludge and muck that they would drain and they would need a place to store this. So this was a designated dumping place. These two 500 foot freighters were sunk here in 1961. And I'm actually sitting on, I'm actually standing on the deck of one of them. And they became um, sort of lodging points for muck and a lot of the rock and soil and dirt that was uh, dumped here. Today, this is a beautiful 88 acre uh, nature reserve. And there's, there's no hint that there are actually ships buried under uh, all of that uh, filth. From 2011 until 2016, um, we had a, a major construction project here in Cleveland. It was the brand new Interbelt Bridge. And uh, I documented that. Uh, early on, I very quickly discovered going down there where you are not allowed to walk. The safety managers pointed it out to me. But they quickly gave me an 18 an 800 number of their public affairs person that I can call. And she would meet with me once, twice a month. I got special dispensation. She'd issue me a, a hard hat, high vis vest, and safety glasses, and I would get to go down and, and uh, get really nice close up pictures here. This particular shot was taken from the parking lot of Sokolovsky's restaurant, which is on the west bank of the flats. It's now closed down, uh, sadly. But uh, I, began I began taking pictures about 7 p.m. one night that had just gotten done raining, had a long lens on a tripod. What I really love about this is that, you know, you've got the context of our beautiful, you know, skyline kind of glowing against the, 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 the faint, uh, you know, sunset there. And then you've got all these uh, iron workers with their welding equipment on the top of uh, lift buckets, um, you know, doing their work there. The plan was to use demolitions to blow the bridge up. In order to do this properly, uh, you don't want it to look like a Bruce Willis movie with things flying everywhere because that would just clog up the Cuyahoga. Um, these guys were doing surgical cuts on key stru structural members so that when the explosives would go off, the bridge would literally fall down in a controlled blast. As part of this process, um, you had all these, uh, the picture on the right, you had all these cutters for a period of weeks, crisscrossing all the concrete, literally cutting into the concrete deck. And a good analogy would be, uh, you know, your sidewalk or your driveway has these crack joints. Well, when things heave and, and, and crack, they go along those joints. So when the bridge would be imploded, this would help in its uh, destruction. Uh, what I love about this is um, I took it under really overcast conditions. So you get this really nice, soft uh, tone light illuminating everything and you get the, uh, the dust coming up. And to me, this was a, an imperfect visual counterpoint to the smoke and the steam coming off the stacks on the factories uh, behind. Another favorite shot is the, uh, the welder on the, the, the left. To me, it's a, a perfect uh, illusionary type shot. Uh, intellectually, we know what he is, but his helmet looks like a space helmet. Uh, I've used a, a shallow depth of field to isolate him against a, 
uh, a blurred out background and the sparks glowing around them almost look like angry bees. So it, it takes on this, this uh, otherworldly aspect. Another one of my uh, uh, great viewpoints for photographing the construction and demolition of the Interbelt uh, Bridge Project was to uh, periodically walk across the old Interbelt Bridge, which was kind of scary. It uh, did have a sidewalk, which was about 15 inches wide. And on one side, you had a railing and then 275 feet down at the river. And on the other side, you had 70 mile an hour traffic whizzing by and boy, that bridge really shook. One day I happened to look down and I, I didn't see the worker, but I did see his long shadow as he approached all of these uh, scaffolding components, which in my mind's eye uh, almost looked like skyscrapers. So again, another illusionary type urban abstract. I've always been really impressed by those uh, early 20th century photographs, black and white of high steel workers on beams in uh, New York City, Chicago, uh, other major metropolises. And I wanted to recreate my own here. In this scene, uh, these two workers are topping off the first bridge with the last horizontal member. And um, I knew this was gonna happen, so I, I planned a shot. And I wanted to, to convey that aspect of high steel hard work. So uh, again, I, I wanna manipulate the viewer. I want the, uh, the, the you know, viewer to see you know, what I want him or her to see. So uh, with a long lens, I position myself about a hundred feet away and um, can ask a rhetorical question. Uh, how high up do you think these guys are? Well, I know how high up I'd like you to think. Uh, the reality is I'm sitting on the ground. They're about six feet off the ground. It had just been raised up and I cropped the view with my lens in such a way so that you don't see the ground, but you do see a great deal of the sky behind and uh, along with the skyscrapers. So it gives that illusion of them doing high steel work. Uh, again, it was color originally, that was okay. To me, this is my homage to those early 20th century workers there. So I did mention to you that, you know, uh, one of the things I love to do is look for uh, abstracts in my urban work and my rural work. Um, you know, using Photoshop, you do have the ability to add anything you want, you know, create trick photography, whatnot. That's not me. Uh, I come from traditional photography and I don't add anything that's not there. Uh, I will enhance contrast a little bit. I will sharpen things a little bit, but if it's not in the original, I'm not gonna add it. Uh, here's a good example of a favorite shot. Uh, there's this fantastic Cleveland sculptor by the name of Stephen Manka. He's worked all over the city and he makes these wonderful sculptures everywhere. This is called Chorus Line Luminaries, which he created back in, I believe, 2006. If you've ever been down to Playhouse Square, which is down around Idea Stream and the Playhouse is there, uh, you may have noticed it. This actually sits on the uh, East 6th Street RTA bus shelter. And from this angle, and this was intentional on my part, this is very reminiscent almost of the uh, Martian war machines in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And I just think it was pretty cool the way I shot it. Uh, some more work by Stephen Manka in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, those are his arcs. Uh, I don't know how many there are, but uh, they take up the median strip of uh, Euclid Avenue and run for about a quarter mile or so. There are these massive stainless steel arcs that just kind of are embedded in the ground and they have these nice LED lights underneath. Again, I shot it with a really narrow depth of field and in the background you have stoplights of cars, um, uh, you know, the traffic lights and, and, and whatnot, adding an abstract uh, uh, element to it. Another one of his works, uh, Senior, Games, Senior Games Flames, which is located on Mall C, that's right below it. This is a, a tight, uh, narrow crop of it. And what struck me was it, it uh, again, this, this was truly a color shot and I, I love those colors. And I placed it in such a way that it's framed on the right by this massive, dark, uh, heavy black skyscraper there to, to give it kind of a, a sense of anchoring. I don't know if uh, many of you have heard of a, a 
festival, a festival we have uh, annually here in Cleveland. It's called the Ingenuity Fest. I try to go to that whenever I can. In 2010, the Ingenuity Festival was held on the lower level of the Detroit Superior Bridge, otherwise known as the Veterans Memorial Bridge. Now, what was really, really cool about this was for this particular Ingenuity Fest, they erected a 60 foot wide waterfall from that lower level. They pumped up water from the Cuyahoga and channeled it across these, these water jets. It would flow down into the Cuyahoga. Then they had these massive floodlights uh, you know, playing up against it. And the way I shot this, uh, to me, it, it's almost like lava is just kind of flowing down, getting ready to cover the flat. So again, it's another, it's another illusion. As Stephen King would say, beware, clowns are everywhere. <laughs> uh, last fall, uh, went out to a dinner with some friends down in the flats and we were walking it off afterwards. It was around uh, Halloween and we came across this uh, bar window and I noticed there was this clown on the inside. The longer I studied him uh, and, and kind of you know walked around different angles and that, uh, I, I got this sort of three-dimensional effect uh, as if he was literally coming out of the window. And that's how I shot this. Uh, again, I used a shallow depth of fields to make the emphasis just on the teeth and the eyeballs, trying to make it as creepy as possible. And again, the uh, lights around him add to a nice abstract element. And uh, that's the result. Um, that item down in the lower left-hand corner, that's a, a common hay baler. Uh, I've um, uh, seen those many times out in the field under the sunlight, no big deal. This particular one I saw on my way down to South Chagrin Metro Park one day, and by cropping it pretty tight like this and framing like that, it's almost like a, a Stephen King creature kind of peeking around your, your windowsill. Now, uh, for this next one, there's this incredible uh, uh, author who does these wonderful art books. His name is uh, Simon Stallenhag, uh, St Stallenhag, okay? And a few years back, he did this incredible book called uh, Tales of the Loop, which uh, has these incre incredible robotic machines uh, slowly, stealthily marching across a, a Nordic landscape. And I only actually discovered this uh, a couple months ago, right here in Windhurst. Uh, this is called uh, Beyond by, uh, I believe his name is Alexander Leibens. It was created in 1985 and it's a 30 foot high uh, steel sculpture. And I've, I've shot it on, on a bright and sunny day and it's, it's an okay picture, but uh, I decided to visit it during this recent snowstorm. And to me, it's, it's almost like one of uh, Stalin Hogg's uh, robotic creatures kind of, you know, searching through the landscape almost in a full, full, forlorn kind of way. And it's uh, one of my recent uh, favorites. Gina and I love to hike and a favorite area is the uh, Maumee Bay area. And you have the Ottawa Wildlife Refuge, McGee Marsh. And uh, one day, a few years back, we were hiking through the McGee, the McGee Marsh when the rangers were doing a controlled burn. Um, the purpose of a controlled burn is to literally burn down the vegetation so that tree saplings do not have an opportunity to grow up. Uh, normally, you have this thing uh, out in the wild called secession. You have, um, uh, you know, uh, marshes and grassy fields. And then if you leave them alone, they'll eventually develop into a forest. Uh, they waited for the uh, uh, you know, bird season to pass and that. Every year they do this, and it uh, does not allow any of the trees to grow. So uh, what's maintained is this marshland. So you have this nice ecology of amphibians of salamanders, uh, frogs, toads, and whatnot, and you don't have uh, trees intruding. Now, what really struck me about this was the coincidental juxtaposition of the nuclear tower uh, cooling operation going on there. Um, this is symbolic on a lot of different levels, and I'll leave you to uh, consider what that might be. Cleveland Metro Parks, uh, one of our favorite places. Uh, Gene and I, uh, we each volunteer about 150 hours a year there, and we've been um, oh, uh, ardent uh, volunteers there for 
uh, well, ever since the late 1990s. Uh, some of you remember a, a country club called Acacia, which was a golf course country club from 1922 until 2012. Uh, the Land Conservancy, Land Conservancy got it uh, through some generous donations, and then it was deeded over to the Metro Parks. And as, our, as one of our major projects, Gene and I do a photo survey uh, documentary effort of that three times a year. In spring, summer, and fall, we navigate out to 39 specific GPS locations. And uh, Adrian, I think that uh, I, I showed you and uh, uh, you know, Randy a couple of those. And uh, we, we document it. On a good day, we can do that in six hours. And then at the end of the year, I hand all those photographs uh, into the uh, Metro Park Naturalists. Uh, in this way, we're compiling a, uh, you know, a visual record as it reverts from a manicured uh, uh, golf course country club into a more natural state. Now, normally, uh, if this were still the country club, uh, this would not have been tolerated. This is a dead tree and they would have cut this down right away. What this represents in the new regime of, of the natural Metro Park is this is what's called a, uh, a dead tree snag. And it currently um, provides habitat for you know, raptors who might wanna roost there or other birds who will stop over there. It might uh, provide uh, nesting holes for wood ducks, uh, woodpeckers. And as it further deteriorates and decomposes, uh, uh, insects will feed off of it and eventually it'll fall down on its own. This was a color shot, but the way the low angle sun was hitting it, it just really impressed me as uh, this you know, stark high contrast type of image. This was definitely a color shot. And it, if you can make it out there, there's a little uh, bluebird box there. And um, bluebirds prefer to nest in areas adjacent to the forest with a meadow on one side. Uh, swallows also make good neighbors for them, they, they get along. Uh, they like that because they can go and sit on uh, trees, uh, tree branches in the forest. Uh, some, there's some safety there, they can look out over the meadow. And then when they're looking out over the meadow, uh, they are typically looking for lunch. They feed off the insects there. What really impressed me about this picture, uh, again, it was late afternoon, and I just immediately fell in love with uh, all this uh, bright shafts of sunlight going across, you know, the, the bright green, the deep green, the, the purples there, all set against a, uh, a dark, dark uh, forest green uh, background. Uh, also, as uh, part of our, our little uh, hike there, uh, this is an area that's very close to some uh, condominiums just adjacent to Three Village. Uh, this was late fall, early winter. Um, the leaves were off all the trees and the, uh, the shrubs and weeds were all just these dry, dry twigs. To me, this was a wonderful visual contrast to the, uh, the cirrus clouds of the sky and uh, the softness there. Uh, here's a favorite uh, winter shot of mine. And uh, Carl, who's, who's out in Los Angeles, you don't see too much of this anymore, except when you visit back in uh, Cleveland. Um, this is a favorite shot. I, I, I love the way that um, uh, you've got the, the, the deep green of the trees on the right kind of fading off into the uh, dreamy sort of uh, murky, uh, foggy distance there. Uh, this view no longer exists. It was excavated as part of the newer and expanded um, uh, floodplain of uh, Euclid Creek to help, uh, to help uh, soak up a lot of the rainfall and runoff there. These are a couple of my buddies. Uh, another absolutely fascinating project that I had uh, most recently with the Metro Parks was uh, I, I had the, the pleasure and honor of working with several naturalists on a couple of books. The first one was Slugs and Snails of the Cleveland Metro Parks, or as I say, say there's uh, more to slugs and snails than just uh, drawn butter, salt, and garlic. And uh, more recently, uh, this book, uh, The Fish of the Metro Parks, was released last fall. They're, they're little, small six by six inch uh, stocking stuffers. You can get them for five bucks in the gift shop there. Uh, but uh, we spent uh, several hundred hours at Wildwood Park, uh, let's see, West Creek, um, let's see, where else? Uh, uh, a couple other places, Rocky River, and the naturalists would uh, net these fish for me. 
and uh, then we had these special little little viewing tanks with, with glass, and we would try to get them to to pose. Uh, and then after I'd photograph them, I'd spend a lot of time in Photoshop, uh, you know, finishing off the images uh, for for publication. So that was that was a lot of fun. Now, uh, throughout my decades of photography, uh, another aspect of the type of work that I did, in addition to you know, freelance documentary work and street photography and photojournalism. Um, I did a fair amount, uh, well, probably several hundred uh, weddings and social events, which included anniversaries, birthday parties, bar mitzvahs. I actually did my first wedding in 1972. A, uh, a friend in the uh, uh, dormitory where I lived said, uh, uh, gee, I like the way you do your newspaper work. Why don't you shoot my wedding? And I says, are you kidding me? He says, no, no, just do it that way and that'll be fine. So uh, that worked out. I didn't get sued. And I quickly discovered that uh, if, if I shoot weddings, I can charge money for it. And when I got money, I could buy better equipment. So this was a win-win situation. Well, pretty much every wedding I've ever done was a lot of fun. All kinds of stuff going on there. Um, put your own captions there, all right? Uh, also got to photograph uh, bridal parties in some really interesting places. I think you'll recognize that. And then just about every wedding I've ever done uh, always had some aspect of beauty to it. All right. Um, also about this time, I started doing a, a fair amount of uh, PR photography or marketing photography or whatever. Um, my, my favorite uh, uh, public broadcasting organization is WVIZ WCPN IdeaStream. And uh, about 2006, uh, they put out a call for volunteers and uh, they were looking for people to uh, you know, help with crowds and do name tags and pour coffee. And uh, none of that really excited me. So I called them up and I said, um, hey, I can take some pictures if you'd like. They says, sure. So uh, I started getting phone calls for the various events. And uh, those have been pretty incredible and, and uh, a lot happened uh, until things kind of stopped with COVID. Got to meet a lot of really interesting people. Uh, that's Garrison Keeler smiling <laughs> in the upper right hand corner there. And uh, very interesting working with him. Uh, he made it very clear that he would, he would tolerate my picture taking just so long as I didn't get in his way. Uh, that's Drew Carey down in the lower right, okay. And that incredible lady on the left, do you recognize her? Uh, she's a little bit older than uh, when she uh, had her heyday in motion pictures, but that is the incredible Ruby D. And uh, I believe she was about 85 in this picture. And just, she just, you know, some people just have this aura about them. And I will always remember meeting her because anytime I do an event like this, I always go up and introduce myself, you know, hi, I'm, I'm your stalker for the evening and I shake hands. And I was no different with Ruby. So I, I reached out to, to shake her hand and she took my one hand in both of her hands and she looked down at the hands and then she looked into my eyes and looked into my eyes and she said, my, you have really warm, hands and she wouldn't let go. I didn't know what the hell was going on here, but uh, I was kind of digging it. <laughs> Finally, I, I kind of backed out of it and thanked her. And, and uh, uh, that was a moment that I'll uh, always remember. So uh, my uh, you know, tip of the hat to you, Ruby. Thanks for the memories. Uh, we did a lot of other fun stuff at uh, uh, WBIZ. And I'm, I'm sure you remember when PBS had the Downton Abbey series. Well, one of the fun things that uh, VIZ did was they would hold these uh, Downton Abbey teas at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel and some other places. And uh, they would invite uh, people to uh, dress up uh, in appropriate garb there. There's a, a cutout of Maggie Smith on the, um, on the left there. There's uh, Carson in the middle and uh, pay no attention to the guy in the, uh, the bowler on the right there. And uh, so, there were, you know, really a, a lot of very memorable times here, and some of them were actually quite 
poignant and a, and a little bit sad. And uh, I'm sure um, probably most, if not all of you Clevelanders, remember a, a wonderful man by the name of uh, Dick Fiegler. And um, he, um, uh, he retired some years back and this was his official uh, goodbye to the audience, goodbye to uh, Cleveland Broadcasting and, and his bowing out as he came and spoke to a studio audience of about 200 plus people. And it's kind of wonderful, one of my favorite pictures because of the emotion it conveys there. So uh, with that, uh, again, I wanna thank you for all of your patience and uh, appreciate that you uh, watched this. And at this time, I will gladly uh, entertain uh, any questions you might have. Thank you. All right. And at this point, uh, I believe I stopped sharing. Yep, indeed. And there we go. There we go. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, Stu. That was an amazing presentation. Well, thank you all. <laughs> Oh, it was so beautiful. And getting to hear the stories behind everything was just stellar. So I'd love to open things up to questions. Um, I have one in the Q&A, but just a reminder to everybody, if you would like to ask a question out loud, raise your hand. I see a couple over there from Rachel and Ben. And then uh, if you type them in the Q&A, I will read them for you. So first I'm going to hit up Rachel. I'm gonna see if she actually wanted to ask a question or hand's been raised for some time. So. See? And go ahead, Rachel, did you have a question for Stu today? If you do, unmute yourself at the prompt and you can ask it out loud. How about that? Can you hear us, Rachel? Ah, there uh, we go. Are you talking to me, Rachel Shantz? Yes, I saw your hand raised. Was it an accidental Zoom hand raise or was that a, I have a question? Yes, and I hope I didn't bid on any of uh, the work. <laughs> yes, it was an accident. Oh, an accident. Okay, well, fair enough yeah. then. So, yes. well, thank you. Yes. We <laughs> now, we now owe $1,000 to the archives. Thank you for your donation. <laughs> we'll take that out of PayPal. It was great hearing <laughs> from you, Rachel. So, thank you for coming, Rachel. We'll go ahead and pop over to Ben then. So, I just want to say, since I'm on the air, Thank you so much. It was a great presentation, and I've been to many of those places. Oh, I think we, I think we lost Rachel. So, but thank you, Rachel, for for jumping in. So next one I see is Ben Hauser. So you're about to be asked by a photographer. So do. Oh, your Ben. Time. Hey, Ben. How are you? I'm doing good, Stu. How are you doing? Great. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, yeah, it was a, a great presentation, and I, I was uh, glad to hear uh, some of your early history, too, which is um, kind of what my question centers around, um, so so everyone can hear me, right? Oh, yes, you're good. Okay. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit of your early training in anthropology, and I've never thought about that in relation to documentary photography, but um, I think that's that's a, 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 uh, an interesting set of kind of parallel subjects there. So uh, is there an element in your work that you view as kind of like a, a visual anthropology? Well, uh, actually part of the anth anthropology coursework I took um, involved what's called uh, social or cultural anthropology, okay. Mm -hmm which is studying humankind and society at large, which in my mind, I call that street photography. <laughs> so that's one way you can look at it. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the professors told us that, you know, uh, everything you learn uh, is potentially relevant and useful in anthropology because, you know, you are looking at people in situ in their actual living situations. Um, the significance of, you know, photographing that project was uh, the uh, grad student supervising, they, they kind of rode me to, to make sure that I did my job right. I learned the importance of, of structure, proper documentation, uh, timelines, uh, you know, being organized in, uh, you know, creating a, a narrative study of what happened over those, uh, you know, uh, 10 weeks of the course. So I kind of ported over those uh, uh, habits into uh, you know, photographing, documenting the construction of the Interbelt Bridge, 
Um, when I'm called to shoot an event at Idea Stream, you know, it's my goal to create that narrative that tells this story. And uh, even more recently and, and uh, more fun is when the Artist Archives has an opening, uh, I have a lot of fun uh, photographing the people there, interacting with the artwork and enjoying themselves. So yeah, I, I guess you could say I kind of ported a lot of that stuff over. Okay, great. <laughs> I've seen some of those pictures from the events. I can, uh, I can see what you're, what you're saying. Okay. Thanks for checking them out. Appreciate the question. Thanks, Ben. All right, so we're going to move on to the next one, which is Jim, another artist member of the archives. So, Jim, you've been asked to unmute. Go ahead and unmute yourself at will and hit up Stu. Oh, uh, good evening. Uh, yeah, Jim Sopelsa. Uh, the, um, I was uh, fortunate to uh, take the time to stop in and take a look at your uh, incredible show uh, last week. Um, question I, um, the, 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 Beautiful finish on those, uh, all the photographs, whether they're black and white or color, or whatever. But uh, if you could just explain a little to me uh, on the process of an archival digital print. Uh, is there, uh, how much, how hands-on are you with that? Is it something you do yourself? Is it something you, you just direct? Uh, is it, uh, could you give me a little background on, on how they're printed at this point? Sure. Yeah, glad to. Uh, I, I do my uh, I do all my own printing. Uh, I've got a uh, large, about fifty pound uh, Epson wide carriage uh, printer at home, and um, I uh, use primarily uh, Epson supplies for that. Uh, it's uh, Epson paper, Epson ink. Uh, they call it archival. Uh, they say it's supposed to last for at least a hundred years. Some tests claim two hundred years. I won't be around to judge that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I try to make the best, uh, you know, prints I can, and at least uh, as long as there's uh, digital media around to convey it, uh, you know, I, I have the original digital files there. I use the, um, I try to use the, uh, well, I, I do use the highest quality inks and papers available. I use a very heavyweight uh, fiber, what they call Burita paper, which is kind of, um, it's, it's reminiscent in the wet darkroom days of the old F surface. So it's, it's not, it's got a luster to it, but it's, it's not a luster print. It's got a little bit of a tooth to the surface and a little bit, of, little bit of an F shine, but it's pretty thick and heavyweight. And I do recall that when I used heavyweight uh, paper in the old wet darkroom, it's quite similar to it. So uh, yeah, I, I control the whole process from start to finish and um, uh, but it's done right at home here. And th what the last time you had an opportunity, I mean, we're just like a your conventional dark room. When's the last time you were ever used that processor? I'm I'm embarrassed to say that uh, there are people who are going to throw rotten fruit at me. But uh, 1979, uh, that's the year I got married, and my wife informed me. She said, "Stu." This is a kitchen, not a dark room. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I spent, uh, you know, about a decade in a dark room. My, my father, uh, bless his heart, actually built a dark room for me in the basement of our house. And I mean, I, I spent uh, between that and late night in the newspaper, uh, dark rooms at school. I mean, I spent, you know, thousands of hours of, of uh, wet work there, running on deadline, uh, doing things for my own pleasure. Um, dark room work, work is somewhat antisocial because you're down there literally in the dark like a mushroom. Uh, nicer thing about uh, digital dark room work is uh, at least my wife can be sitting across the desk from me on her laptop and working as I'm working and, and um, uh, we can talk about what we're going to have for dinner that night so she doesn't have to run down to the basement. So there are pros and cons of each. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, so much. And then for people for the future, what I'm going to do is after you ask your initial question, I'm going to mute you so we can try to get through more questions. So, but if you do want to come and have a conversation with Stu in general, we fully support it and we'll make sure to get you in touch with him. So I'm going to go on to our next question, which is, I see a hand raised from a fellow photographer and archived artist, Jenny Jones. Hey, um, Jenny. Go, I've asked Jenny to unmute and hopefully we'll get a hello from her. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Jenny. 
Great hearing you, Jenny. Thanks for coming. Oh, I wouldn't miss it. Um, I worked with Stuart on the on the on the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, yeah, we had a wonderful time. But Stu's real talent is a sense of light. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's really perfect. I mean, I've never seen some of your pictures, some of which you didn't show, but your morning light. Well, hey, you 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 certainly rubbed off on me during that project, and I, I feel you know uh, wealthier for that. So I, I do appreciate uh, you know working side by side with you. Thanks. Well, well, we had a great time, and uh, it was a lot of fun. But I, your morning pictures that you go out to get. Thank you. Hey, re remember when we were running around in in uh, the kitchen there at the uh, at Providence? Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> that was. Cool. Yes, it was. That was funny. Yeah. Oh, it's and great. Actually, Congratulations. Uh, that was very well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone should pop into the archives because believe Kelly, you can correct me that we have some of Jenny Jones's work currently on display because what we do in the archives is take pieces from the permanent collection and use them in the entrance gallery and even the bathroom, every space we have to get that collection out there. So if you want to see Jenny's work, sort of a master student, if I may be so bold, kind of connection, come on in and take a look. Oh, she, she's got these wonderful big works hanging there that that kind of dwarf mine. Just really something truly to behold. So next, I actually have another, uh, I'm from the Stuart Pearl Fan Club. I have a Mr. Colavoy here who surely has a question for you, or at least very much a hello. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Joe to unmute. Okay, it's Joe, you. Well. Oh, I hear it, Joe. How are you, Joe? I'm fine. I'm, hey, slightly Joe, overwhelmed. I'm slightly overwhelmed by this character, Stu, that showed me with very funny faces, which is really what I'm all about. I'm so pleased, so excited to see this presentation and to be able to uh, really see some somebody taking uh, notice of his unique talents in both uh, the way he explains it and the way he photographs it. I wish that copies of what this broadcast could go to every camera club in the world because it inspires people not just to shoot a bridge, not just to shoot a flower, but to look at, at the world a little different, a little more open. And I think Stu, it just, he sets the stage. Thanks much, Stu. Well, thank you, Joe. You're, you're, you're too kind. And, and uh, uh, hey, any, anytime you want to shill for me more, I'm, in, I'm always open to it. <laughs> Thanks. that change of perspective. Uh, next, I have Mark Spanner up. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute Mark and go ahead with your question whenever you're ready. Hey, welcome, Mark. Thanks Hi, Stu. Hi. Good, good to see you. Um, I'm really captivated by the link between you and your father. I mean, when you look at it, and I remember Moses doing all those paintings of the flats areas, etc., it's almost like between the two of you, you've got a 70 year love letter to Cleveland. And I wonder if you had always looked at your work as kind of continuation of what he was doing. It's a really good question. Um, not really. Um, I, I know it kind of looks that way. And uh, my wife and I have talked about this a lot. And she, uh, dad cast a giant shadow, uh, which was a good thing. And um, she wanted to see me develop my own style. Now, did he influence me? Yes. Did he sometimes take me on field trips with, with him to the Collinwood train yards, uh, the flats, uh, you know, the, the Marconet? Yes. Uh, you know, how could I not be influenced by that? But he, he never, you know, told me to, you know, this is how you do this and why don't you do that? But just by having spent time with them in these places that became familiar to me, uh, it was kind of natural that I gravitated towards it. Uh, working downtown for 40 years made it very easy for me to get up a little extra early in the morning and hit some of these places and see what they looked like under, you know, the morning light 
or stay a little later and see what they look like at sunset. So yes, there absolutely is that connection. Um, I, I never really, you know, thought of it in, okay, uh, you know, next week, this is what I must do. It was always just kind of a stream of consciousness thing. So, but yeah, hey, I mean, he influenced me. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But thanks for asking. I appreciate it. And actually, I think, uh, Andrew, if I uh, lowered your hand, go ahead and raise it again, then that's my apologies on my end from Zoom chubby fingers, I guess, on the end. Okay, good. I have... Go ahead, and we have one from Andrew Reach, another amazing artist. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, thanks so much. Hi, Stu, and uh, really enjoy the presentation. Oh, love, love um, your work, too. Yeah, thank you so much, but really wonderful to see the whole kind of history from the beginning and to hear about your love of photography and certainly how it's manifested is quite amazing. So I know, I, like me, I mean, I, I'm not a photographer, but I did take photography at Pratt, but coming from the times we came in, it was all film, dark room, printing. When did you first go digital? And you did mention, you did answer that question. I think you said not early on 1979, but how did your, photography changed did it uh was there anything that you kind of changed from the whole process or did you just see photography as photography regardless of what method was being used to achieve the end that that's a really great question and i appreciate you asking it um i didn't go digital until 2006 actually and what had happened was i was still doing a lot of weddings by that time in film and I had some really great gear, uh, Hasselblad, Hasselblad equipment, which is what the astronauts used on the moon, pretty expensive stuff. So I, I was um, reluctant to dump it for digital stuff, but it, was, it used medium format film and it was getting really, really expensive. And all the other shooters were going digital. And for me to do wedding work, it was becoming cost prohibitive. So I, I did the transition. And the one thing that I immediately started doing was experimenting that previously would have been cost prohibitive had I been doing it strictly in film. I could take more risks. I could shoot more pictures. Um, I can go out on a limb and do it. So I always had the basics of, you know, the appreciation of, of light and dark and shadow and texture and that. But because I had a less expensive way of experimenting now, I could, you know, kind of push it more and not go broke. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I took those basics, some of which were classroom taught, you know, back in the 70s, much of which was self-learned. And I just kind of ran with it. And uh, I, I continue to do that today. So in, in some ways, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, but in other ways, I've really done my best to finesse that self into something uh, a little more developmentally mature. So I, I hope that answers your question. Sure. And so it looks like, so we're at 8.15, so I just, I'm gonna buzz, there's a couple of questions in the q and I'm just gonna ask real quick. So we'll do like rapid fire to like loose it up. Um, we have a statement from Lauren Baker. It says, do you remember the connection we have in common? It's about a 20 year difference. We were not aware of the same scene at the same time. You did the photograph and I did the drawing 20 years later. Ooh, I wanna see those side by side really badly. Not, now who, that who, who, who is that again? It's Lawrence, Lawrence Baker, archived artist Lawrence. Oh, Lawrence Baker, well, okay. Um, oh gosh, um, yeah, Lawrence and I, uh, and Lawrence, thanks for coming, I appreciate that. Um, we talked about that, oh. I'm sorry, brain dead. Uh, <laughs> if you remember it and you can think of it, we yeah. will totally put it on social media side by side to show the comparison between it. Oh, so that Lawrence. way we're not staring at you asking you to yeah. pull it up in your memory. Thanks a lot, Lawrence. I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Now. I'm going to be lying and be awake trying to think what the heck was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely. I'll reach out to you too, Lawrence, and like we'll find out what it is and then we'll put it up there so people can kind of enjoy that connection. I'm fascinated by it. Good. Good one, Lawrence, thanks. Yeah, you, you stumped the presenter. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> that, that's well, not next, hard. <laughs> stop. Well, the next one's straightforward. This is from Joan Milligan. What is your favorite camera to use and why? Uh, 
<laughs> well, well, the easy answer is the, the, the favorite camera is the best camera, which is the one that's in your hand uh, when you need it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, really, I, I basically kind of have two cameras right now. Uh, there's my, uh, my Canon digital camera, which is now coming on nine, 10 years old, and please don't break. Uh, it, it's pretty versatile in that. And then there's my, uh, my iPhone, which is amazingly versatile. And boy, with each new iteration of these things, they just get better and better and better. And um, I would never criticize, uh, you know, where those things are going. Uh, I do prefer my, my big, heavy, clunky thing, because uh, it pr creates a, a larger file with more control. But um, hey, it's not to say that uh, there's a time and place for a smartphone. So <laughs> actually, you have a preternatural sense of Q&A because our final question was from Bill Franklin, from William Franklin. It said, do you ever take street photos with just a cell phone? <laughs> Full uh, circle. <laughs> sometimes I, I do. Um, but uh, usually if I'm on a mission, and what I mean by that, I, I, I have a, a plan to target an area of Cleveland that I want to hit. Uh, I'm I'm going to uh, you know gear up with all the equipment, and uh, so yeah. <laughs> well, that's perfect timing. So that is all of our questions. If you have any additional questions for Stu, I'm sure if you send them over to info at artistarchives.org, I will get them to Stu. He's super friendly, as you can see, and will probably happily answer them. Um, but without further ado, just Stu, thank you for an amazing program tonight. Awesome attendance. You have a lot of Stu fans out there. And uh, with that, we'll throw it over to Executive Director Mindy Towsley to close out the evening today. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna keep it really brief. I just wanna thank everyone for coming again. Um, remind you that Stu's show is up until March 12th. That's a Saturday, that's the last day. Please come in and visit us. Um, there are many photographs that are quite beautiful that Stu did not get to show you tonight. So you're gonna have to come in and see them in person. Um, thanks very much, Stu. Great presentation. Um, I loved hearing all the stories um, that I hadn't heard already about the photographs. And um, thanks, Megan. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Everybody have a good night. Jeff, you did a great job. And audience, I love you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> you did great, Bye, Stu. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. <laughs>